let's get you're good there. Well, let's let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll jump to it. So, yeah, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gift of uh, first the gift of this fellowship, God, the gift that you are present with us here. And Lord, we know that is the the greatest thing. And God, we thank you for giving us this word, uh, this record of your word, Lord, for meeting us and speaking to us through your word. God, open up the scriptures to us today. We pray, help us to hear you. Help us to learn from you, with you, God, and with each other. Um, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so, well, first thing, i got to move this uh, thing here. This is Tom, This is covering just Tommy's face. And, you know, so I don't know. It's going back and forth. Okay, which way are we going <laughs> to But then, you know, you don't know what's happening over there. Some kind of, you know, mischief going on. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um so today, I thought since, you know, I didn't, with Brother Charlie being out for a couple weeks, maybe a little bit longer, I didn't want to try to plan any certain full series that we do through here. I also didn't want to keep going with what he was doing because, you know, he already kind of had it planned out. So I decided, all right, we got kind of a one-off week here. And I went with the inspiration of Mimi. I don't know, you didn't bring your trophy along with you today, did you? Okay. Well, uh, I'm not sure if you've even gotten it yet. But there was, you know, when we have our game nights on Friday nights, we have the trophies. And on the back of them, we have Bible verses written. And so I just thought, hey, we're going to get one of those verses from the back of that trophy and just dive into that. Because part of why we have those on the, is like, well, first and most importantly, they're funny. Uh, I, I think they're appropriate verses for playing games. And it's, yeah, I like pulling half sentences of scripture out of context. It's always a good time. But then once you've enjoyed that, um, it's nice having a regular reminder of, like, scripture verses and, like, what they have to say to us and what really is on offer there. And so I thought, hey, let's take a little bit of time, dive more deeply into one of those, so that each time we have this game night when we pass off the trophy, we not only get the reminder of how much fun we're having, which had, it was a blast on Friday night, um, despite my own loss. Uh, it was a really good time. Um, but also then just to remind us of, like, what these passages have to say to us. So I thought we'd better start off with the winner's passage, um, which is in 2 Corinthians 12.1. So 2 Corinthians 12.1. Um, and that we only have that verse on the back of the trophy there, but I thought, hey, we'll, we'll go for the longer uh, context around that verse as we look into scripture today, because, you know, like I said, we're pulling half sentences out of context, but it's more helpful when we're actually studying scripture uh, to get a little context, to read full sentences at the very least. And usually, uh, maybe even a full paragraph to really get us going here. Um, and so, as we get turned over to 2 Corinthians 12, we'll actually start reading at uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30. Because just a regular, your regular reminder that the chapter numbers aren't original to the scripture. Like when Paul or Peter or James or whoever it was is sitting there writing out. Uh, the different letters in the Bible that they wrote. They weren't like, and now I begin chapter 11 of my letter to the Corinthians. Like, these were added later to help us find find the page easier. Like, that, they're there for our handy purposes, kind of like page numbers at the bottom of other books that you're reading. Or like the little stems and numbers on the side of uh, when you read like Shakespeare back in school, if you can remember that. And they're like, look at line number 114, you know. Uh, that's what these are, the equivalent of that. Nothing holy about the numbers, they're just there. And in this case, it comes right in the middle of the flow of logic. So we're going to start in chapter 11 uh, to get our way into chapter 12. Um, would somebody be willing to read? We'll tr we're just going to go ahead and read the whole. We're going to read 12 verses here, or a little bit, just over that. Um, so maybe could somebody read us <coughs> verses 30 through 33 in chapter 11 there? And then we'll get someone else to jump into the next few after that. Yeah, thanks, Randy. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window to the wall want to take uh, verses 1 through 5. Next, Carol. I must boast, there is nothing to be gained by it, but I will know all the vision and the revelation of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was known by the Spirit of God, and whether his body is not out of the body, that we do not know. God knows, and I know that this man was called out of the Spirit of God. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. And he heard things. 
we'll finish off with verses 6 through 10. Look at those. Just to make sure we didn't miss kind of how this uh, long paragraph here gets bracketed. I'm going to read the very first sentence and the last bit in it. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And then at the end, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. There's your everything else in the middle just fleshes out that. I mean, that is like kind of one sentence with everything else in the middle being like the stuff that just adds adds more to it. If I'm going to boast, I'll boast in what shows my weakness. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. There's your thesis. There's your kind of point of this whole uh, thing here. But right in the middle of it, in verse 1, the one that we have on our trophy of victory, uh, is this, if it is necessary to boast, nothing is to be gained by it. But then he goes on and he's like, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. And there's this whole thing about this grand revelation of the Lord. Has anyone ever heard anybody talk on or describe or like this idea of what, what exactly this vision is here? Because it's not an obvious thing. Like if you read this, you're like, what's the third heaven? What is he do? Like, what is he saying? If I go up in body or in spirit, I don't know. Like, has anyone ever heard that kind of explained? Because it's, if you feel confused by it, you are in good company, because there is nothing that is immediately obvious about what this means. This terminology has been lost through the ages of Christianity. There's really no record of exactly what uh, these phrases meant when they were used in this day, and everybody's best guess today is kind of conjecture. Um, it's not been carried on as a part of the tradition, where some words were like, oh yeah, we all kind of still use it in that way. This one, these phrases here, what the third heaven is, that we're just kind of given our best guess here. So yeah, is, anyone have an idea as you read that? Have you heard that explained before? You're like, oh yeah, here's what, what this seems to be. Okay, well then, that, that is a perfect place to start. So here, um, what, as you read through that, rather than me putting all the questions here, what questions, what seems strange in here? Or what do you not quite know what the passage is getting at when you heard it read through? Let, let's start with that, because this is one of these passages, there's a ton here, but if we start with the questions we're asking, that can help us get a lot deeper into the answers that we're going to give uh, in the end. So what, what questions did this raise on what was confusing, or maybe you weren't quite sure what the point was of something you were saying? place. And one of the things I'll just mention in another place in scripture this kind of recalls is 
when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness. And one of the temptations in one of the Gospels, I forget if it's, uh, w which one describes it in this way, but talks about um, Satan taking Jesus to the top pinnacle of the temple and saying, oh, you could just throw yourself down for me. And that's one of the things people say, oh, is this a vision he's having or is he really actually standing there like physically? So, yeah. In today's language, instead of saying, I know a man would say, I'm asking for a friend. Right. <laughs> I, I think that's a really good way. That's what a lot of people read this and they say, oh, he's, he's talking about himself. And especially the way he leads into it. He's like, I don't want to boast, but I think I have to a little. But, oh, there's this friend about, yeah. And it's like he, that, that's certainly how that's, most people read it in that way. I think some also say, oh, maybe he actually did hear this from um, someone else that he knows. Or, you know, maybe another apostle or one of the people he traveled with, like, um, you know, there was Apollos was around in that day, or Silas was a traveling companion, or, you know, these different people who um, Paul spent time with, like, oh, maybe he's talking about one of them, and so it's kind of like his uh, co-pastor, and he's like, oh, still refraining from bragging on behalf of somebody else who was known um, to the community. Certainly, he's talking about somebody who's known, otherwise it's just a weird way to um, kind of put all this. But yeah, I, I, that, that's a, I hadn't heard it put that way, but that's a really good way to do it. I, I'm asking for a friend here, yeah. So yeah, what other questions just jump out to you here? What in the world is the third heaven? Like, I know about heaven. I mean, I know something about it. Like, that's a mystery, too, to say I know about heaven. That's like a ridiculous claim. Because, of course, there's so much I don't know about heaven. The Bible gives us great glimpses, uh, gives us a lot about the character of it, but like what it looks like, what there's... We're not given all that much. So, okay, I got that. The third heaven, what are we talking about here? And this is very much like we, um, one of the things that we know for sure, and this is not answering what the third heaven is, but we live in a very different, uh, to use the big word, metaphysic. Uh, like we imagine the structure of existence very differently than people did in this day. Um, so whether people were like followers of Christ, whether they were faithful Jews, faithful Christians, whether they were, um, you know, servants of Baal, but it didn't matter, like, we have a very different imagination of what existence looks like than was held in that day. So, one thing, just a little side rabbit trail here, is that tells us that we don't need to have a perfect conception of all of existence and what the shape of the universe is and what the, uh, how our bodies are put together. We don't need to have that exactly right to faithfully follow God. Like, that's not a prerequisite to follow God correctly in these bodies. We can misunderstand ourselves and still follow after God. Or we can also understand ourselves pretty accurately and not follow after God at all. Like, we can, there's not a prerequisite of getting all of science right before we follow God. So yeah, they had just a very different thing. There were these different images of maybe there's like, almost like, you know, they talk about waters above and waters below in the time of the flood. There's also, at some point, people had a vision of angels essentially being like, a layer in between like heaven and the earth and almost like if you'd see a map of existence there's like oh here's hell you know Hades the place of the dead and it wasn't even all that negative it's just the place of the dead here's the place of the living here's angel layer here's God layer and it's like this like wild kind of thing when you look at these old maps of it it's really different than how we do it so something like that is probably what's going on in this first heaven second heaven third heaven um, there's this third heaven that's being talked about and we just have lost track of exactly what that means, but we know he's like, has a picture in his mind, kind of like old explorers when they were traveling around the world, and they had like the map in mind, you know, poor old, I mean, I say poor Christopher Columbus, he's a pretty awful evil person, so I don't want to get too, uh, too sad for him, but he goes sailing off with this map of the world in his mind, and then he comes slamming into North America, and it turns out his map was just not accurate at all, there was so much more to it than he knew. That's how it is when we start imagining things like heaven, we, there's always more to it than we know. Um, and here, yeah, there's just something going on. So yeah, a third heaven. What in the world is it? Who is it? Who's there? How are they there? We got those questions. What other questions jumped out to you as we read through this? What do you mean work on your weaknesses? Because I, I like where you
jumps out so quickly just this focus on weakness is so unusual because we usually want to kind of hide those things and kind of not you know other people find out eventually anyway but we you know try to hide what we're weak in and keep that hidden from everybody else and here it's and I think even going beyond that it's not only like focus on those and let those be you know present but like precisely there in the areas where we're weak like is where God's strength is to be found most fully. Like that is the exact place. It's like it's not in the strengths. He's, we can't boast in those because that's not where the value actually is. Like I don't. He is trying to be humble here. Like that's a, a value. But here, where he's talking about boasting and weakness or strength, I don't think it ultimately comes down to. He's not first talking about humility. It's saying like he's actually trying to accurately describe God's work here. He's not, that's just, as we read this, always remember, like, this is a book, the Bible, uh, but specifically Corinthians as well, it's about God's work, not mostly about our work, that ours is kind of a, a mirror to God's work, and so that, yeah, but, is 
this very uh, the same letter earlier on has that image now in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians verse 7 we have this treasure in jars of clay and talk about like we're jars of clay um, you know which are such fragile things I mean they you know do the job well but there's nothing all that pretty about them and, but they drop on the floor and psh, they just shatter they're not holding their strength um, but it's precisely to show that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us like that there that is how God's power is shown is when you see it in these you know fragile vessels and you see the power of God at work you know that can't come from us like there's nothing about us about these bodies about these lives because um, he's not just talking about our physical fragile lives but our you know Corinthians these two the Corinthian church is the most just broken, sinful church that we see described at length in the New Testament. There are so many problems in this church. Like, there's a part in the first letter to the Corinthians where it seems like they're doing a little bit worse. It seems like they're they're uh, working through some things by the time he writes the second letter, but they're still, they're not in great shape. There's a part in it where he's like, the kind of immorality among you, we don't even see among the pagans, is how he puts it. And it's, he's talking about, like, incest. Is, like, he's like, People marry in their mother-in-law or their, you know, stepmothers, and like all, it's like these just bad family dynamics. Like, what in the world are you doing? And he, you just hear the frustration and the like. I can't believe I have to say this to you on these pages of the letters to the Corinthians, because he's just again and again getting to these basic ethical ways of living together. It's like you're not getting it. You're doing it wrong. But at the same time, it's right in the middle of this. Incredible Incredibly sinful, obviously broken church that is not producing the fruit of God on its own. He's saying, where you see this coming up, it's from God. Because it's not your, you don't have strength. Like, we're talking all about your weakness throughout these letters. And I highly encourage, like, spend time in these letters, especially if you are feeling discouraged. It's, on one hand, more discouraging because it's like, yep, the church has always been like, if you get one of those days where you're like, man, you know, you watch the news or whatever, you're like, church sometimes does some really dumb things <laughs> and then pick this up and like, we've always done these dumb things what is good you might feel on that one hand more discouraged but then it's like right in the midst of this that he comes out with some of his more, most powerful images of like oh this all surpassing power is in these very broken fragile clay jars and that power is not from us and so we can't stop it no matter how egregious our sin is no matter how fragile our bodies are no matter what disabilities or illnesses or whatever we might be carrying within our bodies um, no matter what exhaustion we might carry in our minds, no matter what dementia might enter into our thinking, like no matter what it is that's not the location of the strength which is supposed to be at work among us it is at work among us, it's always something from God, and I, I specifically mentioned that um, dementia piece one, it's something you know, so many of us have, have dealt with either in our own lives or the lives of close loved ones to us, and um, but one of my uh, really, really just excellent professors that I had in my theology training at one point is someone who spent a lot of his time, he worked in hospital settings, um, and specifically with um, people dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, dementia for a significant period of his ministry. And he wrote a book a couple years ago that was specifically on that topic. And, um, not going to dive too deeply into it, but the, um, basically the, sub, the subtitle is like Living in the Memory of that was where it's like even if we're losing our own memory of the good things in our life and, and even if we're losing our memory of what the church has done and is and God like if we start to forget who God is that God still remembers us that it's not even our own the strength of our own memory where this power is located but it's like God's memory that never forgets and never abandons us and it's going I mean that it, it was just such an excellent it was like the most life giving book that I read in a while and it was just going all the way down because especially you know, those of you who've lived through that more closely than I have at this point, like, you know there, there's nothing that goes deeper um, than that in terms of feeling the fragility of, of this human life. But even right there at the very bottom, like God's strength is what's well enough, and that, that is what's there. And that's what we can see it most clearly, because we know nobody else is bringing the strength, whether you're the one experiencing those things or caring for the one who is, like, everybody's exhausted, <laughs> but God is not.
something I think the church has just an ongoing temptation with this. We always want to have, uh, we, the very general we of, of the church universal, where we want to have more power than we do. We want to have more success than we do. And, you know, as a, someone who's been working in the church for a couple decades now, and volunteered in a lot of ways for a time before that like there's a lot of church conferences that happen um, and they tend to give these very like well put together pictures of like oh here's what church leadership looks like here's what um, you know here's what success looks like and they're, they're bringing speakers who are like often at these they're along with the speakers who are Christian leaders there's like business leaders and things and like how do you know they're a good business leader oh because their business made a ton of money last year like that's kind of the evidence of it which is not particularly Christian evidence, so I always get frustrated with that part, but, um, you know, we go to these, and like, this just doesn't always map on to the vision of success that we actually find in Scripture, and it's not just at conferences that we have that shortcoming, like, in so many other ways, we try to set up a certain kind of success that just doesn't look like what we find in this passage, but, just gonna read these last words again, The pages are sticking together a little bit today. Um, when I am weak, then I am strong. And just before that, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's not... Here, if we, especially by the time you read through both, this is at the very end of 2 Corinthians. Like, this is the last kind of bit, and then you get chapter 13 is, is uh, you know, kind of the final greetings, given greetings to particular people. That, but this is right near the end of two long, like two of the longer letters of the New Testament, and we're nearing the end of the second one. And so we've seen all these problems laid out, but also we've seen this reference to weakness and strength again and again and again throughout these two letters. It's weakness is not just incidental to where God also shows up there. It's precisely there. Like that is where God's strength is more then God's strength is in places of our strength. It's precisely when we confront our weakness, when we are in that place of being most weak, that God's strength is the strongest. And it is not, we don't encounter God's strength as much. God's strength isn't as clearly seen or made known to us when we are strong. That's the overall message that we get by the time here. We're catching the, you know, the end of this logic, but it's been time after time after time, weakness gets brought up throughout these letters again again, and again, and again. My power is made perfect precisely in weakness, would be an appropriate word to add, to add in there. My power is made perfect in weakness. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary word um, that it doesn't not apply to any of us. what I think is so extraordinary here is like there's our the step that like it feels like Paul started at the beginning of this he's like oh I want to go to rehab on you know he, in uh, what was it verse 7 where he talks about this thorn in the flesh um, he has this thorn and that's another one of these questions people ask is like oh what is this thorn is it a recurring temptation he's facing is it 
looking at the con climate and the place that he lived, maybe he actually had a literal thorn that got stuck in that they couldn't get out. You know, I, I had a, uh, um, uh, a sea urchin quill stuck in my toe for like two months once, like it was just there and it just got in. Eventually it was not there anymore. It worked its way out, but it was like, oh, we couldn't, it just, we couldn't get it out. And it just, you know, stayed there. It's like, oh, maybe he actually just has a, a thorn. Maybe, we, you know, we think too hard about it. We think it's a metaphor. And he's like, no, I got this thorn. And it just, you know, maybe that, but whatever it was, it's like he was starting at that point of doing all the things of like how to make that weakness, allow that to be strengthened, to grow and to not be such a hindrance to him anymore. And he gets to the point where it's still there. Like it, it becomes a one which no matter what you do, like that you can't change this. Like this, this is simply what, that's the reality of his life at that point. Like there's a, whatever this thing was, was not going away. And that was the moment that suddenly it hit. Like, got, and it hit, I say suddenly it hit. It's not like a, a realization, but he said, <coughs> it hit because God said to me, the word of the Lord came in to meet him right at that moment when he recognized, oh, this thorn is not changing. Like this is going to be a limitation of whatever form for the rest of my life. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And that's where it like that it the the thing of a weakness starting to become a strength happens fully because of God's work coming into that moment and not um, because of any work done on the person. The person brings the vulnerability and the willingness to acknowledge that weakness and to want it to be to become a place of strength. And then the only strength that comes in is God's. But leaving Paul himself in this particular case like that weakness is still just as weak as it ever was but it's not weak because God's strength is there like it it just turns it inside out and it's it's this amazing thing that's like he starts in PT and ends up like with a jet powered wheelchair is almost like you know it's like there's just this strength comes in that is something that he never could have gotten to on his own and it becomes his greatest strength what he thought was his greatest weakness because God's power um, is made perfect precisely in weakness it's such an extraordinary thing and I love that like this passage I wanted to read the whole thing I appreciate reading through this longer thing because it's so extraordinary because in the middle of it here's this vision of being taken up to whatever this is this mystical experience being taken to the third heaven like what's going on here it's so beyond us to even figure out and like you know I, i've known people who've had like experiences that get described in a similar way i don't you know i don't know what this experience was to say that i know anyone who's had the same um you know, i can think of one particular thing in my life where i'm like oh yeah i described it was just like a just a once in a lifetime kind of a thing that was just different than normal day-to-day -day life and somehow that is not the main thing here that the main thing ends up being not like, wow, that was amazing and God showed me so much and now I'm gonna tell you all about you know, heaven and all about everything. It's like, you know, God showed me all that to reveal that precisely as I leave this experience, whether in body or in spirit, and come back into this frustrating place where I'm stuck with this thorn sitting here still in my flesh, God's power is perfect right here. And it's like he was able to see a vision of the perfection of God's power and then realize it, but that didn't go away when he returned to his his moment and his place and time and his broken body. Like, there's the perfection of God's power right there. And it's not only off in heaven, but it's right here. And that's that, it's like that connection between these two things, the mystical experience and this vision and the day-to-day, -day, like, are brought together by the power of God. And it's, it's an extraordinary passage and yeah, spend some more time with it. It's one that just keeps on yielding. I mean, we could have gone in 20 different directions off of here and had, uh, yeah, I'll let Tom give us the last word here. I, I,
think that you know that's kind of what makes sense to me, and I'm always I know I'm just kind of putting my own framework on how, but that that basically makes sense to me is yeah that we're talking about what we think of as heaven, um, and largely because we've you know the heavens was always used to talk about like the starry sky, but we're you know in our scientific age of discovery where Hubble is off there, you know we like we don't experience these things in the same um, fully the same spiritual way that they would have been experienced by people who didn't have any scientific knowledge of them. They're just on these very things. And, you know, people knew they traced the sky. They knew a lot about them, but, like, they didn't know the chemical composition and they hadn't landed anyone on the moon. You know, it's all... Um, so, anyway, that all, that all about makes sense. Um, so, as we close, I'll, I'll say a word of prayer. And I'm also going to pray um, really coming out of this um, passage here. This was a, a passage that... Um, uh, Meredith, who, you know, I know I've shared before, she has Crohn's disease, and this has been one that was really important for her early in the diagnosis of having that disease that kind of got brought to mind a lot. And she was a college student, you know, a young woman at the time, experiencing this life-altering moment, and God came in and brought this really home to roost in her heart and her life, um, this exact message of God's power in that. And so she's actually not been feeling very well this week. Um, seems some Crohn's kind of stuff, maybe not exact, but anyway, just not feeling... Uh, you know, feeling under the weather. to the point we did a COVID test. She doesn't she tested negative for that, but like that's the kind of thing she's been dealing with. And she's preaching this morning. Um, their service starts at 10:30, and so as we finish up here, they're just um, getting started. And so I'm going to pray for pray for her as well as we pray for uh, for us as we go forth. So um, yeah, Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you for opening your Word to us this morning, and God continue to speak through this Word to us throughout this week. God, bring it to our minds. Um, and Lord, bring your word directly to our own lives. And God, we thank you for speaking directly to Paul and helping Paul to share that word with us, that you are speaking directly to us through the same words that you spoke to him. Um, God, we just thank you for your faithfulness and for your strength. Uh, Lord, make us comfortable with our, with our own weaknesses that we could find your strength there. Um, Lord, we lift up to you uh, right now. It lifts up to you, Meredith, that she's bringing your word this morning. And Lord, uh, let your strength flow through her, even in this moment of her physical weakness. Lord, we lift up Brother Charlie to you as he's continuing to recover from uh, having his pacemaker put in. And Lord, we ask that your strength would be manifest to and through him uh, in this place of his own weakness, God. And we ask that you, um, yeah, Lord, bless him and keep him. And even at this point of all these years of ministry he's done, all this time he's spent in the word, Lord, reveal to him uh, even more and afresh. Uh, your power in the place uh, of weakness that he's in at this moment. And God, we ask that you would show more of yourself to him um, and more of who he is in you. And we pray your blessings on each and every one of us as we go forth today. Help us to worship you honorably and fully and to listen to you well. In your name we pray.
things or doing something with that time, but we'll be back together again there uh, next week, Thursday. Um, and I just invite you all to join, whether you're able to be a part of that team that's actually you know, physically picking up food and handing it out on Thursday mornings, keep that ministry in your prayer. Um, I certainly get to see from my perspective um, just how much the need for this sort of ministry is growing and has grown over the last couple of years. We've all seen that, we all experienced that, especially with the recent uh, hike in food prices at the store, um, gas prices as well. Like it is, people are getting pinched in ways that it, they keep adding up and it's adding up to life-changing circumstances for a lot of folks right now. Um, so I just invite you to be praying, pray daily, pray often for our neighbors, uh, for ourselves, for our loved ones, and also for our neighbors who we may not, not even know um, who are dealing with really difficult circumstances at the moment. This particular week, I happened to get a number of different phone calls from folks looking for some extra assi assistance and had the great <coughs> blessing of getting to pray with, talk to people in a lot of different situations, but um, that's not the kind of thing that is, uh, that's not a burden I can carry on my own. Fortunately, we all have God carrying that burden, but it's, it's a communal burden. I just invite you in to join and be praying for our neighbors and to um, do what we can to be loving, loving each other and loving the Lord in that way as well. Um, something else going on, talking about food, a, a very fun food thing. Next week, Sunday, is the first Sunday in July, which means that'll be our uh, first Sunday feast day for our young adult uh, kind of folks. And so, yeah, next Sunday after church, we'll be having lunch together. So if you are in that age range or if you know someone who is, um, you are invited to come and stick around after the service next week um, and join us for lunch, and we'll have a great time. We always have good food and good fellowship, and we just uh, stick around. We uh, if it's not scorchingly hot, we've ended up eating on the porch over behind the cottage there. And if it is, we'll eat inside. But either way, uh, it'll be a really good time. Uh, we also had a very good time this past weekend. It was game night. Uh, we had game night on Friday night. And uh, am I doing this one? Here, uh, yeah, Matt, Matt's going to come, come on down and uh, tell us about game night. But for those who haven't been a part of it yet, I just need to encourage you. Game night, we're doing it every month. We've been doing it a few months now. You keep hearing us talk about it, but it has been a great delight and a real joy to be a part of. Uh, I look forward to it every month, and the one time I had to miss it, I was very sad to do so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great time. We have food. We play games. All are invited. It's an easy thing to bring a neighbor along to if you just have a friend or a family member or anyone who you just say, hey, come on out and have a very casual night. You don't need to know a single person in the room before you come in, um, and you can enjoy yourself just playing dominoes. So, uh, yeah, Matt, come on up and tell us about how game night went, uh, went this time. Thank you very much. Good morning. All right, um, so I know we usually talk about the tough competition at game night. Um, there wasn't that this time, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, it seemed like it at first. I know at our table, um, I think we were within what, 50 or so points it, at any given time. It was pretty close, yeah. Um, and we got all excited because we thought, oh, we at least have the lowest score. Um, and then at the end of the night, it turns out, no, we had nowhere near the lowest score. I think the highest score and the lowest score were both in their kind of league of their own by at least 100 points. Um, I know, so for the lowest score, um, which is really impressive, I don't know, you know, if you've played dominoes before, you probably can kind of figure this, but if you haven't, um, so Mimi won the lowest. She had 144? I think so. So 144, so we do 13 rounds. So that's about 10 points a round on average. That's really good. Was um, she keeping score at that point? No. <laughs> That's, and then yeah. luckily got small numbers when, right. when I got stuck with them. Yeah, that's, that's the sign of a good score. Even know it. Yeah. Sign of a good scorekeeper is that they win. So <laughs> there you go. Not to call you a bad scorekeeper, Ron, but. And, and Matt knows because he was the scorekeeper at our table, and obviously he didn't figure out who won. Yeah, yeah I won at our table. Um, but like I said, Mimi blew the ball out of the water. And then. I don't, we don't have an official, like, statistician for game night, but I think Wanda broke a record Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> I made John. Yeah. I think last time, John, when he got the trophy, had 444 or something like that. Five, Wanda, five, five. 550, five, 500 and something. She, 
we weren't even close. She got it. There was no doubt, no questions about it, no you know calls on the play. She she got it. <laughs> That's her trophy. Was her husband Ron keeping score? <laughs> So it wasn't as competitive, but you know, it can get there. Um, the one thing I did want to mention, which was something that really kind of struck me Friday night, <laughs> there was a couple of times I had to get kind of snapped back into reality. The food we had Friday night was some of the best food I think I've ever had at game night. We had barbecue sliders that Carol made with macaroni and cheese on top of them. We had strawberry cake. We had, I think, pe peanut butter, peanut butter balls, peanut butter balls. Uh, Potato chip cookies, my favorite, absolute favorite cookie in the whole wide world. We had several of those. Um, what else did we have? Sandwiches. Memento cheese sandwiches. We had a really delicious slaw that Aaron invented just for game night. That was really good. I mean, if you don't come, if you don't care about competition, come for the food because that's you know <laughs> that's the good part. So, but it was a great time. Look forward to it every month. If you haven't been there, come on over. It's great. So, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, for real. It is. There can be even a table for people who are avoiding the game and just coming to have. We might make you get food last if you're at that table, but, um, but yeah, no. It was. I I got in a little bit of trouble by the time I drove home at night. The all that sugar I ate kind of halfway through, and the sugar crash hit about halfway on the drive home, and I was just like, okay, I gotta stay away. It was. I was getting a little. Uh, I, I I was okay. I was driving safe, but it was. I felt that sugar crash coming in because there was a lot of really good sugary things there. So uh, yeah, yeah. Come on out. We'll we'll let you know again. We'll give you a warning a couple weeks beforehand again next month. And um, yeah, come on out and join the fun. It really is a good time, and we go home with bellies full and hearts full too. So um, with that, let's pray, and we're gonna uh, turn our hearts towards worship with the joy of the Lord among us. Lord Jesus, you are good. You give us so many gifts, God. You give us the gifts of laughter, of fun, of fellowship, of friendship, and Lord, you give us above all the gift of your presence and your life. So Lord, give us more of your life this morning. Open our hands wider to receive that life from you. Lord, may we be blessed with all of your good gifts, and Lord, nourish us and grow us up, uh, that we would not only be blessed by you, but that we, we would be a blessing to others. Use this time to start that, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you now to help uh, join your voices into this time of worship by standing as you're able, and we'll say our call to worship, uh, and as you're able again, you'll find the words up on the screen. I'll read the regular print, you join in on the bold. I consider the days of old, and remember the years of long ago. I commune with my heart at night, and search my spirit. Will the Lord never again be favorable? Has God forgotten to be gracious? I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on your work. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as you. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people. When the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. Your path was through the mighty waters, yet your footprints are unseen. You led your people like a flock. Amen. And I think we might need one extra moment of warming up our voices a little bit before we start singing here, because especially as you know, fewer of us with some folks traveling and that. So let's let's get our voices to full force. And do you know that we're, we have the call and response of God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We're, we're going to do that right now. So let's see how, how loud you can do this response here. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Now we're ready to sing. <laughs> Take it away. Everybody away? <laughs>
singing this morning all and now uh, Lucia's going to come on up and give us some updates on how we can be praying for one another and blessing one another and asking for God's blessings in our lives thank you Lucia to pray for her cousin or the her cousin and all of the family I'm sorry John Millage um, he has been on life support and, and there is no sign of activity improving so on Tuesday they are going to take him off of life support so let's remember Carol and the rest of the family as, as they mourn and, and just think about him this week um, we have been asked to pray for Wanda Bourne's daughter, Lonnie Marie Atnip, so let's remember her in prayer. Shirley Rogers um, is in rehab this week um, and still needing prayer, so let's pray for her and the family. We have been praying for Richard Price. He um, was diagnosed with cancer that does metastasize, and so um, we had, had been, again, asked to pray for him, but they thought his cancer had metastasized and realized through some testing that it had not. So that was a praise for that family. Praise the Lord. Um, Laurie Whitworth is improving, but let's continue to pray for her and for Tommy and Linda. And then Chris Perkins was on, put on our list last week. He was in the hospital, but he is now at home. So there's another praise. God is just... So good to us. I love it. Thank you. But then here's my favorite praise for the day. Annabelle drove herself to church this morning. Okay, let's continue to pray for Ann Sensenstein, Brenda Tate, Britt and Faye Knox, our Cannon County High School student, Carlene Higdon, Carol Reed, Charlie Heath, Chris Sharp, Colton Tuck, Courtney Lancaster, DJ, Dallas Roller and his family, David Barrett, David Martin, David Peeler, Deborah Derrick, Deborah and Michael Peralta, Dot Browning, Eleanor's friend Marilyn and her husband, Eugene Pinkston, Faye Fan, George Waller, James Campbell, Jerry Ann Tenpenny, Jim Gage, Jim and Deborah Swift, Joanne Johnston, Kat Merriman, Kathy Emerson, Katie Prater, Kim Tucker, the Critzler family, Linda Lawson, Lisa Simons, Marie Claxton, Mary St. John, Mary Lou Burdick, Meredith Lilly, Michael Craig, Michael Garner, Mike Zapeda, Mildred Faust, Missy Smotherman, Ola Duggan, Pat Huey, Pat Ledoux and Jennifer and their family, Pat Nichols, Phil Yates, Randy Greenwood, Renee Sevilla, Richard Price, Ryan Buskey, Sharon Rawls, Terry Gum, Tiffany Gaither, Tiffany Lucas, 
Wanda Parker, Wendy Franklin, and Worth Thagger. Are there any others? Yes. Yes. She uh, had shingles. Right. And really suffered from that five weeks. Last week when we were at Marietta, I saw her. And she said, Carol, you texted me and said, my church is praying for you. Yes. And she said, within like 10 minutes, she started feeling better. And she said, if I could drive with you to visit <laughs> your church, she is back to work. She oh, wow. Great. Wow. And Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have something? Yeah. Um, I had a real praise. Um, was one I actually neglected to name in church last week, but uh, a very good friend of ours um, who lives up in Nashville, we were friends from back when we lived in D.C. and both have made our way to Tennessee since then. Um, in his mid-30s, he's uh, been having really significant uh, back problems got to a point of being completely debilitating, like couldn't uh, get off of his back, couldn't even sit in a chair for a couple of weeks. Um, had urgent back surgery uh, this past Wednesday. Um, it was supposed to be in July and they moved the, the date up. Uh, anyway, right after the service last Sunday, uh, drove up and just had that like, oh, we, we just got to pray together about this and, and prayed with um, he and then his family, a couple, just a couple other folks were there. And we had this time of prayer it was just very short, really brief. Uh, mostly we just hung out, you know, as he laid in bed, not being able to even really, like, turn his head to the side. Um, but it was included in the group of people, like, somebody was praying who even started the prayer by saying, you know, God, I'm not even sure that you're really there. You know, you know, I'm kind of saying, like, you know, I've done but I'm just adding my voice into this anyway. Had that surgery and, like, got home and we were getting, uh, my wife Meredith and I were getting all these excited text later that day of, like, I'm walking around the house with no pain. I'm sitting at the dinner. We're having family dinner together. This is, it's night and day. It's amazing. And it was just like such a full and immediate answer to prayer. Um, wow. And it was, that was certainly not the only group of people praying, but it was just like seeing that answer so quickly. And I'm just still feeling so encouraged. Yeah. By it. Oh, it that great. is awesome. Let's clap again for the Lord. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord and thanks and in continued prayer. God, you are good and we want more of your goodness. So Lord, keep pouring it out. Keep opening our eyes to see your work around us, opening our ears to hear the testimony of your people. Lord, let us hear the voices of those, even if they don't know you, God, who are singing your praises. And Lord, we look to you for your goodness, for your healing, and for your salvation. God, we continue to lift up all of these that we have named before you today, many of whom we've been praying for months, Lord, for the same things. And Lord, we know that you do not grow weary of hearing our prayers. Lord, you want us to continue to pray, to continue to lift up those that we love, that you love even more um, before you. So God, we do that. We do that in response to your invitation today and in response, Lord, to your example that you do answer our prayers. Lord, we come before you today with joy hearing these uh, testimonies of your healing that you've done, of the work that you are about in this world. God, we thank you for just how very good you are. Lord, give us perseverance to go through those seasons and times and situations where we can't quite see your goodness yet, when we can't see the answers to our prayers and it feels, Lord, like we're not even being heard. Lord, Spirit, come, give us your faithfulness, give us your endurance that we can continue to pray, continue to love, even when it seems like it's not making a dent. Lord, open our eyes to see your work. Open our lives to receive your work and to be changed by you. Lord, use us. Use us in prayer. Use us in service. Use us in close comfort to those who need comfort. Lord, use us for your purposes and draw us closer and closer into your kingdom, further and further in. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, so I, I invite you, we're going to uh, close this prayer time. Well, we'll, we'll pray this, and then I'm going to invite you to do something else too. So let, let's say our prayer first. Then. Our Father, our Lord, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Um, as I was starting to uh, take one step a little bit too far in our order here, but um, with Diana not being here today, we are uh, not able to sing our, our, the choir anthem that was uh, prepared for this time. And so what I want us to do, we got a pretty good choir sitting around this room right here. And there's one song that I think all of us know, and we can even do it um, a cappella. I'm not going to throw anything uh, unplanned Billy's way uh, when he's at the different instrument. But uh, just the song that we often sing together, that praise God from whom all blessings flow. I invite us, and I'll invite you actually to stand again, and we will be, uh, the full congregation here will be the choir this morning as we sing a song uh, in lieu of our choir song that's prepared. And uh, yeah, I invite us to sing this song that we know, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Praise, Praise God from chapter 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 through 14. Christ has set us free for freedom. Therefore, stand firm and don't submit to the bondage of slavery again. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but serve each other through love. All the law has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So yeah, we had the great pleasure, I know I mentioned a few uh, few weeks ago, we had the enjoyable thing of getting to celebrate kindergarten graduation with Eleanor a few weeks ago, and this, this wonderful little rite that people have come up with, this rite of passage of finishing your first year of school, kind of celebrating that with a little graduation. Well, this week, uh, we were sad to not be able to be there in person, but uh, Meredith and I saw our niece uh, graduate, or didn't get to see her, but she graduated from high school this week, and we were telling Eleanor about it, oh, we're really celebrating your cousin Ari this week. She's like, why, why is that? Is it her birthday? Like, no, you know, you're, you had your kindergarten graduation. She just graduated from her 13th year of school. And she's like, what? That's so long to be in school. 
And it was just such an exciting thing when we get to celebrate somebody reaching that stage, and especially that particular graduation where you switch from high school and go off, many people go off to college and have that where you're entering into this new phase of life or maybe you're going off into the workforce right away or whatever it might be, but suddenly you go from being at home under mom and dad's rules or whatever the rules of the house are and then you go off and you're starting to have to come up with your own rules for living, your own way that life is gonna look. And I have to say, I look back very, very fondly on my early college years, freshman year especially, just so many weird things happen, like things just kind of come out of nowhere. When you get that large of a group of people, all that kind of same age, all slightly irresponsible, but a little bit responsible, uh, you know, coming together in one place and just odd things happen. You end up being up at three in the morning at the diner, just like doing, you know, eating whatever pancakes are available for the cheapest that you can pay because you don't have any money. You, know, you end up watching TV way too late at night and then having to write your paper until six in the morning to get it in on time. Like college is this time of freedom and learning responsibility and it all gets like a little bit messy here and there. I hope it's not quite as messy for my niece as it is uh, for some people when they go off. I think she'll figure it out pretty quickly. She's a pretty bright kid. But I remember my freshman year in college uh, my school uh, brought in the largest class they had ever had the year that I went there, uh, the largest freshman class they had ever had, especially there were a lot more guys than normal in this freshman class. For whatever reason, just this odd thing, there was a bigger group of guys. And so in my, there were two dorms on the campus that were for the men. In my dorm, they put three guys per room that were made for only two to normally be there. So they had to add like a bunk bed and another bed next to it in all these rooms instead of just two normal beds like normal. So I was in a room with my oldest and closest friend in the world. We went off and we, got, we went to the same school and it was really fun to get to go off and room together. And then another guy. This other guy, as it turns out, lived life quite differently than we did. And his version of the freedom of freshman year of college was mostly finding how easy it was to find movies to watch online and then staying up all night and watching those movies night after night after night and then sleeping through class in the morning. This is what started to happen where he, he took the approach that maybe you've had where you have two alarms set because you know you're going to sleep through your first one. He took this approach. He had his alarm go off at like 6 a.m. He's like this optimistic version of him. He's like, I'm going to get up and get to my 8 a.m. class. I'm going to have good breakfast and be all you know, fresh and ready to go. I think the first week he made it every time. And then he started to have to rely on his second alarm, which was set for a full hour later. And he started, then stopped turning off that first alarm and just started sleeping through it until my old friend and I would have to like wake him up by like hitting him with a pillow, turn it, because of course I didn't have class till like 10 a.m. So I wasn't waking up at six in the morning. Like, turn off your alarm. And then eventually he just stopped setting his alarm and just stopped going to class. Needless to say, second semester he was on academic probation. Third semester, he was no longer at school. This is the progression of the freedom when freedom is not put to good uses. As our passage today said, friends, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, to indulge your selfish impulses, to indulge your immature impulses, but use your freedom for something worthwhile. Watching movies late at night is fun every now and then, but if that is the full goal of the freedom that you receive at some point in life, that is a waste of the freedom that you have been given. From the earliest pages of scripture, the Bible is centrally, un unceasingly concerned with freedom. In fact, I should say, not, it's not the Bible that's concerned with freedom, but it's the God who we see glimpses of, who is revealed to us in scripture, who is concerned with freedom. The God who created the universe has a heart for freedom. And from the first time we meet the Lord, we know that about him. We see it as we look throughout scripture, story after story, year after year, generation after generation, freedom is brought into places where people were experiencing bondage. You, have, you think of in the New Testament, you have the Apostle Peter bound in chains in a prison cell, and he's writing letters, writing sermons, and just wanting to go off and preach the good news of the gospel. Paul in prison, doing the same thing, actually in chains and just nav uh, narrating his letters to somebody else who's writing them down, and that person is sending the letters off because Paul can't do it himself. Writing letters of the gospel from a place of bondage. 
You have those same apostles, and Peter in this case, freed from his shackles by an angel coming as the earth shakes, prison doors just pop right open, and the chains fall off, and angel's like, here you go, we're coming out. Another time, the same thing happens, they're all freed, and everybody stays there because they want to preach the gospel to the prison guard who's so overcome that God would free these people, and they didn't run away, that the prison guard's like, I'm a Christian now, what do I need to do? And like the prison guard and his whole family get baptized and become Christians. Freedom coming in to a jail cell. You have countless persons, uh, in, especially in the Gospels, who are bound by the limitations of their own body. People experiencing the bondage of just disabilities, not being able to literally move from the place that they're in. And Jesus comes along and gives healing to someone who can't walk, sight to somebody who can't see, a voice to somebody who's unable to speak, like people gaining the full capacities of themselves by the healing power of Jesus Christ. Freedom coming where freedom was lacking. And even more deeply than the freedom that Jesus brought through healing was the freedom Jesus brought when to these same people, even before healing in some instances, he said, you are forgiven of your sins. Jesus brought freedom from the bondage of sin. And the deepest message he said to those who were ill or disabled or were experiencing just the difficult effects of old age was, you have not lost the value that you have by these things. God is working in you and through you, whether you get the physical healing right now or not, whether you stay exactly as you are or not, you are changed inside out by being freed from your sins. Jesus brought forgiveness, and in doing so, he brought freedom. You have people who are bound by the restrictions of poverty, and then the New Testament, the first thing that happens after the Holy Spirit comes, everybody starts exchanging their goods with one another and taking care of one another. A phrase you might use for that is mutual aid aiding for and caring for one another as each one has need and the other one has the ability to meet that need. People being freed from being bound by poverty to instead finding joy together in their shared general poverty as a community. But there's a lot of love, and so they're free. And finally, and actually it's almost first of all in Scripture, we have the story of the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to whom God revealed himself, find themselves bound in the bondage of literal slavery in the land of Egypt, being forced to build and work for another people who are not their own. And God comes in and he frees his people from that bondage and he brings them to the edge of the Red Sea as the army of Egypt is chasing them down and they see their bondage coming to get them again. And God says, I got this. And he has a pillar of cloud that he's been leading the people with. The cloud circles around instead of going in front of him to show him a way. He's like, the way is through the sea. The cloud is behind you so the Egyptians can't get to you. And the waters part. And the people walk through the sea to the other side. And then the cloud moves aside, allows the army to start to chase them again. And the waters come back in. And the bondage is literally washed away and done away with. And the people of Israel are free. This story of Exodus of freedom from slavery is this story that follows us the rest of the way through scripture. We have, uh, after this, we have Elijah and Elisha both do the same miracle where they use a staff and they hit the water and the water parts, recalling God's deliverance of people from slavery in this just a small way. And this is how they're able to get across a river later in their ministries. These prophets of God recalling the works that God has done. And then we have the place where the people are taken into slavery again into exile, into the lands of Assyria and Babylon. And miraculously, as had happened with no people before, they're brought back to their land, and God restores them to the place of their freedom after having been made slaves yet again. And finally, we reach the New Testament, and the waters of baptism recall the waters of the Red Sea as we are freed from our sin by going through the waters. This is one of the reasons that we have water is involved in our baptism ritual, is that we are reminded of God's deliverance from slavery through the waters of the Red Sea. And we are delivered from the enslavement to our own sin through the waters of baptism. We're freed through the water. God brings freedom where only bondage had been present. God has a heart for freedom. But what is all this freedom for? What comes next after freedom? Because there's a whole lot of life left to live after baptism, especially if you're baptized as a baby, as many of us were. Like, that's a whole lot of life yet to go. What is the point 
of this freedom, of this forgiveness? What is all of this freedom for? God is concerned greatly with what comes next. We're all concerned with what comes next. But we get talking about freedom. Freedom is a thing that we talk about a lot. Obviously, we value freedom very highly. We're in a country that, you know, let freedom ring is a, a words that we sing. Like, freedom is a, is a big deal kind of value that we have, rightfully so. It's a big deal value for God in Scripture. For freedom, Christ has set us free. You can't get more clear than that. Christ set you free. He set you free for what? For freedom. So, like, freedom is a big deal. He doesn't, doesn't need to qualify, doesn't need to explain. It's like freedom in and of itself is worthwhile. But I noticed that in our culture today, we have a lot of different pictures of what freedom is or what is necessary for freedom. And we see it with our two political parties in our country, I think we have two different conceptions of what's most important for freedom. I think we see just in how people have responded to different like court cases recently that we have on one side, we have the democratic vision and not everybody in each party fits this different vision, but, you know, using right and left here is our general categories, which mostly are confusing and all that, but anyway. The democratic vision holds that a right to an abortion is probably the most important freedom on which other things get built, that if that gets taken away, the whole structure kind of crumbles down. And this is what we see when, as the, uh, the case dealing with the row and all these things that's come down this week, that immediately, immediately we get this huge response to that because it's viewed as a primary and a foundational freedom. On the other side, we've had cases dealing with guns and this kind of thing recently, and the, the, right, to, the right to bear arms. And when that gets challenged, that's viewed as the primary and the foundational kind of freedom. And it seems to me that when we look at what people respond to most strongly, what's gonna get the largest rise, if you're talking about Republicans, if you talk about something infringing on the right to bear arms, that's gonna get a bigger reaction than anything else pretty much that you can do. And if you're talking about Democrats, if you talk about something impinging on the right to an abortion, that's gonna get the biggest reaction out of anything that you could possibly do. We have these visions of freedom where holding a gun or having an abortion is the foundational thing for freedom. I have to say, I don't, really recognize either picture of freedom on the pages of scripture when I look at freedom. And part of it is I think both of these are conceived with the same core picture of freedom, which is that freedom is about me. Freedom is for me and my life. I have a freedom from you. I'm free for me. I think we have a selfish version of freedom in our country. And I'm not, honestly, I'm not even giving an answer to the very, very, very difficult questions that are involved with both guns and abortion legislation. These are incredibly complex things, as we all know, they impact life in so many different ways. It's not a universal thing. It's, these are complex things. We're getting at deep, tricky things in life. But how they're talked about, I don't recognize it. When we talk about freedom in these things, the way they're talked about in the public sphere, I just don't, I hear all kinds of people talking and I'm like, I don't agree with you and I don't agree with you and I think you have a selfish vision going on and you have a selfish vision and they're different selfish visions, but it's the same vision of freedom, which is that it's a selfish freedom that our culture is kind of built on. Freedom is for me from you. Scripture turns that on its head. And we find that in Scripture, the deepest bondage that we have is within our own hearts. We have chains that we've forged for ourselves in our own hearts that bond us to be selfish. And what we find in Scripture, in Jesus Christ, is that we're given freedom from ourselves for others. Freedom in Scripture has a point and it's not just for me. The freedom I'm given is to be free to love you. Because on my own, honestly, my instinct is to be selfish every time. Like, the spirit slowly changes that over time, but my natural instinct is to be selfish. So here's just, you know, I, my, uh, I have a PhD in the field of ethics, so uh, let, let me talk about rights for a second. Because I think we, all of us kind of misunderstand what rights are in the first place. 
we don't need rights in law to defend ourselves because we automatically defend our own rights. Like, you pick up a baby who doesn't want you to put shoes on them before they go outside. You know, every, have you ever tried to put shoes on a kid who doesn't want it? It is a hard thing. A kid sticks up for their own rights instinctually and automatically. They don't need a law to tell them, this is your right that you ought to defend. We all defend our own rights literally as a matter of instinct. And we will fight to tooth and nail to defend our own rights. The reason rights matter in law is because it reminds us, hey, other people need this too, and here's the things you need to look out for for other people. The only reason we have rights legislation is because we ought to be caring for one another. And so it's a reminder, because we all need the reminder of what we need to protect for other people. And if we allow whatever right we're talking about, right to free speech, right to bear arms, right to free assembly, right to the press, whatever it might be, if we talk about these things and it ends up only mattering for us, then it doesn't matter at all. The reason we have freedoms for ourselves is to be free to love others. That is all scripture cares about. If we're not loving others, then it's not biblical freedom. You were called to freedom, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence but through love become slaves to one another. Scripture says you are free, and then says you're a slave to Christ, to one another. This is absolutely counterintuitive to the way everybody talks about freedom today. We have a gospel and a calling and a freedom that is going to challenge every single one of us no matter where we sit on a political spectrum, no matter what institutions and organizations we are a part of, this call to freedom is going to challenge us again and again and again and again because our instinct is always to kick and fight and defend for ourselves, but it's less strong when it comes to caring about the freedoms of others and the love that others need. But scripture doesn't bother telling us, hey, make sure you're sticking up for yourself. I mean, some of us need that reminder every now and then, like, hey, you can stick up for yourself a little bit. But it's to love others. You are free in order to love others. And that is a declarative statement. You are free. Because Christ died on the cross. And Christ Jesus has been raised. And Christ will come again. You are free. So what are you going to do with that freedom? If you're using it for selfish impulses, that's not the freedom Christ is talking about. God's heart is for freedom but that freedom has a purpose. And just something to notice on the pages of scripture is that all this freedom at the Red Sea, freedom from slavery, freedom from Egypt, all that happens before the law is given. The law only comes after that. First comes freedom, and then the law comes to say, hey, here's what freedom looks like. The Ten Commandments, all the laws around that are all giving us a picture of what freedom ought to look like. And when you read those, it's astounding again and again and again how often that law includes, and it's so your neighbor can be free. Like I've mentioned this before, even the law right in the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath says rest so that your neighbor can rest. That's the purpose of it. It's right there. But instead we have a picture where to talk about the church, Christians who tend to be more on the left tend to forget about Sabbath entirely. Christians who tend to be more on the right tend to have a selfish Sabbath, which turns into abuse and oppression for others, where it's like, hey, don't go getting healed on the Sabbath now. Don't go doing that on the Sabbath. You've got to stay put and not do anything. And Jesus comes in and just has a totally different vision. He's like, I'm utterly free to be free for others. Sisters and brothers, I see a vision before me of two different worlds. The first one, is one which is so easy to see because it's there in a blaring and endless cascade of headlines. Every time I turn on the TV, regretfully log onto social media, or even just glance at my phone, and I see this world of anxious people, of bad events going on, people hurting one another, 
people arguing with one another, people snapping at one another, people each fighting tooth and nail for their own little square inch of ground. And of course, if you feel like you don't have a square inch of ground of your own, you're gonna fight hard for that. But this world is before us, it's in our ears, it's in our eyes, sometimes it makes its way down into our hearts. This is a world of fear where people are looking out for their own interests and mostly at the expense of the interest of others. We have this idea that there's only so much good to go around and so we better get it for ourselves and everybody is going for what's theirs. Arguing with one another about how not nobody else is taking care of them as they're supposed to be. Uh, the verse that comes right after our reading here, still continuing the same thought, it says, if you don't put your freedom to the good work of others, if instead you bite and devour one another, Take care that you're not consumed by one another. Scripture saw this coming, saying, if you're not going to be using your freedom for one another, you're going to be full of fear because you're all going to be trying to get at one another and you're going to have to be watching your back the whole time. I have a vision of the world that looks like that because it's the vision that is before our eyes each and every day. Biting and devouring one another, fighting with one another for what's ours. But I also have another vision of the world. And this one is harder to see, but it's equally present and goes deeper than that first one. And it's a world where people love others as they love themselves. Where people see a brother or a sister in need and before asking, hey, are you on my team? They reach out to help them in their need. I see a world where we're just as concerned about the well-being of our neighbor as we are about ourselves. I see a world where somebody is willing to put down the task that they're in the middle of because somebody else needs help with their own task. I see a world where more than, you know, we have health insurance that provides for protection in case something goes wrong. I see a world where we don't have need for insurance because we have such strong communities of love that we take care of one another and when somebody is in need, they get provided for because we all are using our freedom for the benefit of one another. I see a world where we're willing to hand out food to strangers, where we're willing to walk down the street and stand outside of somebody's house and tell them that we're sorry that they've experienced a tragedy in their life and let them know that we're praying for them, where we spend two minutes talking to a neighbor and say, let us know if there's anything that we can do. I see a world where God's love flows through us in such a way that we start to actually become more loving, where our lives are changed by love, where in love we're slaves to one another, where our neighbor's needs are a call on our own lives, and we say, what I have belongs to my neighbor because they're the one who has the need for it right now. I see that world and it's harder to see sometimes. It becomes very hidden at times. And then other times it just breaks out in joyous abundance. And I look around and I'm like, here it is. This other world really is here and we are living in it. And then the next day it fades away a little bit. And that first world comes screeching back into focus. But friends, these two worlds both exist in this world. There's the kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven. And they right now are intermingled with each other. They're existing in the same spaces. In these very pews, both worlds are alive and at work. I see a vision of two worlds, and I say, which world do we want to live in? Do we want a world where we have to live in fear, or do we want a world where we can live in the comfort that comes with loving and being loved? The hardest chains to break are the ones that we forge in our own hearts. Let's work on that with all of our strength, and all of our heart, and all of our might. Let's work on putting those chains into the grace of God and allowing God to break them open that we can be free to be given and love as Christ was given in love. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Through love, become slaves to one another. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. Don't let this verse go by without realizing how striking it is. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
And many of you might be saying, wait, what about the most important commandment being love God you know, above all else? The reason you can say it's just the one law here is because there is absolutely no way anyone is living in accordance to that law if they don't first have the love of God coming to them. You don't get to obey this law without obeying the one to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because it's God's love that can enable us to love others in that way. So friends, love one another as you love yourself. Allow God's freedom to be freedom for others. Experience love flowing through you that you can be truly and abundantly free. Let's live in the kingdom of God, which is already among us, and one day will be our all in all. Amen.
sometimes you are free. 